Why don't we start off at the beginning to provide some context? My mom was a single mom back in, you know, back in the 50s. It wasn't really a popular thing to be a single mom. So she uh, would she would place me with with uh, families. And uh, many times the families were either ne- would neglect or abuse or and so that she'd find out. And so then she put me in another family and put me in another. And it's so. So I had this, um, I didn't even know my mother really that well, because I would only see her maybe once or twice a month for a weekend, you know? So, mm. so I had this really weird kind of childhood coming up, you know, I, one family to the next, to the next, and I got to see a lot of different belief systems, you know, a lot of different lifestyles. And, um, but I just, I didn't see where any of it was benefiting the people that were caring for me. So I, I didn't adopt any of their belief systems. I didn't adopt any of that until my mother finally, when I was 14, brought me back um, into her life. And, and, and she and uh, it would be my stepfather moved to Arizona with me. And, um, and so because of this dysfunction, you know, I was kind of a very independent, self-involved kind of person, you know, even at that age. And um, and I didn't really feel that anybody was looking out for me. So I kind of was very self-reliant. Um, and 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 kind of and my philosophy was I cut my swath through life. That was it was as simple as that, you know. I mean, and which is really one-sided when you think about it. You know, it's it it really doesn't take anybody else into effect. Because I didn't really feel that anybody was there for me. So, so I would, I felt like I had to look out for myself. But when I was in Arizona, I was, because we'd moved from New York, I was a long haired hippie type kid in a cowboy town. And the cowboys didn't like me. And, but, and the hippies were a little too passive for me because I was a New Yorker. Mm. So I hung out with the native kids. And um, because, hey, I got along with them, you know, and so their grandmothers saw the dysfunction that was going on in my life. And so they kind of took me aside and they started to, you know, teach me things. And I think they really I think they saved my life, to tell you the truth, because I, I really feel that they the, the little wisdoms that they, in, you know, that they gave me were seeds that were planted in my being that really just, um, you know. They took root a little bit. And and that's exactly what I needed at the time was, you know, just some 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 just down to earth wisdom about here we are on this earth. The earth is sacred. Let's um, you know, let's let's find our inner self, you know. And and I actually did a I did my own vision quest. They kind of taught me, kind of schooled me on how to uh how to do a, my own vision quest in order to get in touch with myself. And um I a number of attempts and I finally was was successful in um in actually leaving my body and having this vision quest. And so uh so I really attribute a lot of uh a lot of my growth to these, you know, my friends' grandmothers. But then you know you have to get on with life. You just have to get on with life. And um you, know, you got to get a job. You got to make make some money. You got to make your way in life, right? And so you kind of put that stuff aside. You really do. You 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 just, you know, okay, you know, that was what I needed at that moment, but now I need to really focus. And so um so and and my family didn't have a lot. So there wasn't much opportunity for me to go to college. So I went in the service instead, you know, and I, I went for engineering and became an engineer. And that another, you know, in the kind of, I guess, kind of in the right place at the right time, you know, for that sort of thing. But it really, I became that engineer. I had that engineer mindset, you know, that you know, everything was pretty much black and white. Okay. That's just the way I saw life, but I still had that self-serving self-involved kind of uh, mentality, you know? Yeah. You were in the Navy, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. I was in the Navy. Um, and, uh, and I was an engineer in the Navy. It, um, yeah, it, it was, it was, I had a successful career while I was in the Navy. What, um, what made you go from Arizona to the Navy? Cause that's kind of a, a big well, stretch. You know, the thing is, is because I always had an interest in diving mm-hmm. as I, even when, uh, before we moved to Arizona, I took scuba lessons and stuff like that when I was in my teens. So, um, so I, I, I always had this love and there's not a lot of scuba opportunities in Arizona. You know? no. <laughs> nope. So, uh, so I, I went in the Navy because I really, I, I really wanted to continue and expand um, my diving opportunities, you know, and, um, but I, I thought I was going to go to UDT. I was going to be a seal. I really <clears> thought I was going to do that. But Are they um, still the, uh, the, were they called the seals back then or was they, were they still the, uh, the underwater demolition? UDT. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And, and back then you had to join first and then you had to apply for it. Right. You couldn't just go straight in like they do now. Right. 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 That's why I chose engineering, but mm. I also learned that because of my vision, there was no way I was going to get in. Oh no. So I, so then I just focused on, on my engineering, but then I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll, um, continue on and and because you could also uh could also branch out and become a commercial you know more of a harbor diver instead of udt mm-hmm. so um so yeah i went uh i went in and um and then i realized i you know i don't need to continue on this because um there are a lot of commercial dive schools that i went to afterwards um so i i did my time and then i got out and i went into commercial dive school and I became a, a commercial diver, but with my engineering background, I was hired right out of dive school to be the chief engineer of a research vessel. So I was able to combine diving with engineering. It was like my dream job, right? Yeah. You know, that is cool. What, um, when you guys were out there on the night that you died, what, what were you guys doing? What was the research mission? Yeah, we were actually evaluating a new ROV, a remote operated vehicle, um, which is a tethered vehicle. And um, and the design engineer was on board, and and uh, and and we had just completed um, some trial runs with the ROV, and we saw because back this is back in the eighties, so we didn't have quite the meteorologic uh, uh, technology that we had today, but we saw that there was a, a big storm coming up the coast and so this is in the west coast out, out in california mm-hmm. and um <clears throat> and so we just finished evaluating this rov and we we thought well let's let's see if we can beat this storm into the harbor and um but we didn't and and so the, the storm caught up with us and um and the harbor master wouldn't let us in because there were 25 30 foot breakers at the seawall so you know, we figured, well, we'll just stay on station. And so we, we kept about two miles off the coast on station where there weren't, you know, weren't any breakers or anything, but just, just rollers, you know, and um, that was fine. That was fine. But, but the design engineer for the sub and some of the other sub crew needed to get to LAX. And so the captain thought, well, we'll put a Zodiac in the water and we'll zip you guys into the harbor um, because we can get that boat in, but we can't, you know, we can't get the big ship in, but we can get that boat in. What and, kind of um, ship, what kind of ship was this when, that you guys were on? The it, was a, um, it was a, it was a, it was a research vessel, Aloha. And she was, um, she was uh, uh, an old tidewater boat, an old, uh, that was converted. We had an A-frame on the back that we could launch submarines with okay. and stuff like that. So it was a, it was a modified um, tidewater boat, which is okay. uh, which is an oil field um, support vessel, basically. Mm. But we had converted it by adding a, an A-frame on it, and uh, and we had our own submarines and we had our own ROVs that we um, constantly maintained on there, mm. and um, <clears throat> that always sat on the back of it. We were quite quite a sight to come into the harbor, you know, to see a ship come in with a submarine sitting on it. Yeah, the back. That, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um but anyway on the way the and the captain asked me normally as chief engineer I stay with the ship but um 
But this night, because it was so rough and because we didn't have a full crew on board because we were only evaluating the submarines. So it was just uh, just the main officers and the, the sub crew and the sub crew needed to be relieved. The captain thought I should go in the Zodiac to help because I knew the harbor as third officer. I knew the harbor better than anybody else. So because we didn't have our normal seamen on board, you know, our normal mates. So I I said, okay, I'll go out with the boat, I'll bring it back. You know, with and we had one mate that was was with us as well. So the mate was driving, I was in the bow navigating. We're in a small zodiac with a you know center console and a V V4 in the back, you know. So it was a pretty powerful little boat. We used to use it to retrieve uh sub our subs. And um, and we've been in heavy seas with it, so it wasn't wasn't a big concern of ours. But we took our bearing because it was a stormy night, you know, so we couldn't see much. You could see the horizon was lit up, you know. Um, and so we started heading in, trying to keep our, uh, you know, keep our, our eye on the harbor buoy. But we lost track. You, you, you can imagine you go up on the top of a, you know, 25 foot roller, take a bearing on the harbor buoy, which is also bouncing up and down and then and then run down the trough and up to, the, you know, the next swell. Mm-hmm. And do the same thing all over again. Well, we lost we lost the bearing of the harbor buoy in no time because it was stormy. You know, you couldn't you couldn't see very much, and so we didn't realize. But the storm had blown us a mile south of the harbor, and we hit a breaker zone about a mile out, and um, and we actually we actually drove right off a breaker. You know, you know, like <laughs> just flew right off of it and dropped you know 25 feet and i yelled at the mate turn us around because we're in a really bad place right here yeah and so he turned us about and just as he did the next one came came down on top of us and it folded that zodiac in half like a peanut butter sandwich i was in the bow it catapulted me into the ocean but fortunately this night and this is back in the 80s we had these old (laughs) we hardly ever wore life vests because you know, we're divers, we spend our life on and below the surface all the time. And so um, this night, we actually went down to the bosun's locker and put on these May West, the old fashioned May West, you know, World War II orange <laughs> pillow type, you know, yeah. life vest. And, uh, and so I was like, I was really happy I had this vest on because that that wave pounded me into the into the water and i was tumbled and tossed like a rag doll i mean it was the most violence i think i'd ever experienced in my life and um and so i just hung on i just hung on tucked myself up and i was expecting may west to take me up to the surface and it didn't happen it just didn't happen and i i got to that point where you get the euphoria from oxygen deprivation and all of that and i eventually breathed salt water and i drowned and I found myself in this void, this darkness, Um, but it was calm. It was quiet. It wasn't the roar of the ocean. I wasn't cold. So water was very cold. This was in March in California. It's very cold water. And um, I was comfortable and it was quiet. And so I was very curious because I just, you know, went through this violence and came into this, you know, quietness. So I was curious, what's going on? What's this all about? And I saw a light. And this, and it felt like I was moving toward it. And so, I, you know, I don't know, you know, you hear moth to the flame. Well, you kind of feel that way. You know, I was just drawn to this light because it was the only presence there. But it, you didn't really feel alone. And I was very comfortable. But, um, but I, I felt like we were moving toward this light. And as I got closer... I saw that the light was made up of millions of lights Mm -hmm. and they were all acting in unison. They were all kind of like, you know, moving and like they had one mind and they were multiple colors of lights and they were all these millions of fragments. And as I got closer, the um, three fragments broke away, came toward me. And as I did, I was feeling this love. I was just feeling loved. And I like this warm embrace. And um, and they were welcoming me home. That was 
an incredible experience just to be feel like welcome home. Because remember, I, I mentioned I didn't have a, much of a family understanding, you know, and to suddenly be have this feeling of being home with what I perceived as a family, because eventually there were about a dozen that greeted me. And and it, I call them my soul family because they it just felt like a family. And we then went into the light where we went to this area that felt like a bubble. And we went into the sphere and we started to relive my life. It was pretty intense because I was uh, not only living, reliving my life, but my soul family, they were reliving it with me. And it was more than just a, a sequential viewing of my life. It was like I was reliving it, but not only through my perception, but through everyone I'd ever interacted with through their perception. <laughs> so it was like, you know, my consciousness fragmented into these multiple streams and I could view my life from all these different directions at the same time. It was humbling. <laughs> I <laughs> bet. The least. It was humbling. Yeah. You know, Jay, it, it, um, you see things, I was, remember, I was this brash young man and I had this philosophy, you know, self-serving philosophy. And and I, um, I got to see how harsh I really was, you know, and how, how I didn't really take other people into account. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I saw that and, and my soul family was experiencing this the same way I was. And so I was a little ashamed of what of some of my actions, but they just supported me. They just loved me, supported me, buoyed me up, helped me to keep moving through this review. And eventually I came to the point where I had died, I had drowned, but then it continued and it, it was a little disorienting. It, it you know, I because I didn't have a foundation for it, but my soul family again supported me. You know, and we we continued only in the life review before my, you know, in the part that was my life was all crystal clear. But when we went past my life into I didn't realize at the time, but it was my future. When I started seeing future events, it was like there was this central corridor that was absolutely crystal clear. But the periphery was like out of focus. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but it was like, it was available. And if I went in that direction, I could go in that direction. But if I wanted to, but it would pull me back to center. And was it I like a decision to, matrix? I don't, I, I'm not sure. It, it, it's really, to me, it was just this corridor mm -hmm. of, of, yeah, potential. I like to think of it as potential. So it was this, you know, I have all this potential that lays before me. But I have free will to go right or left, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I got the impression that if I went right, it would nudge me back to center. If I went left, it would nudge me back to center again. So that was kind of the impression that I, you know, I got of this, but I got to see these little sequences. And um, but then I eventually reached a point where the light, the light itself now. These millions upon millions of fragments spoke in unison. And I perceive this to be God. I'll tell you. <laughs> when this spoke, it just, it was this incredible, you know, voice that was in my being. It wasn't like a voice, but it was just in me, within me, this voice that just resonated and said, This is not your time. Mm. And I said, No way. I am not going back. You know, that body is in that ocean being beat up and it's cold and I don't want anything to do with it. And I found a family that I didn't know existed and I'm loved like I've never felt love before. There's, I don't want to go back. No. And so I argue with what I perceived as God and, uh, and you can see it didn't really work, right? <laughs> Who <laughs> so won that one? It didn't win that one. No, because yep. the the light spoke one more time. It said, you must return. You have a purpose. As simple as that. But that word purpose just resonated within me. And so then I, I, 
And it just seems so clear because when we're there, we have a heightened awareness. We have a, an expanded consciousness and we're connected to so much more knowledge and, and, and available uh, to us. So with the understanding of purpose, of my purpose, I came to acceptance. And when I, the second, the millisecond that I chose, that I accepted, I found myself outside my body. My body was still being tumbled and tossed through the waves. And the bow line of the Zodiac was, was, had come, the, some of the wreckage of the Zodiac had come close to my body. And, and the bow line was tapping my, my chest. And another set hit the Zodiac, which popped it up because it was a little bit of air left in, in some of the pontoons. And so when it did that, it wrapped that line around my arm and it yanked me up to the surface. And when it pulled me up to the surface, I got tangled up in the wreckage and the waves were beating me up against this, you know, this pontoon. And, <clears throat> and it pushed some of that salt water out. And that's when my soul family gave me a gentle push. And I went, right back into my body it was uh <laughs> and we were still a mile offshore in a breaker zone so uh i think in a previous interview you mentioned that you felt like you were too big to fit back inside your body in your non-physical yeah. form what, what was that like going back in was it just kind of a, an immediate thing in a pop or was it no no it was it was like it was like a vibration it was like this resonance of mm -hmm. of 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 coming back in it was in fact it was even a sound that was attributed with it that came along with it it was like this almost like this hum that mm -hmm. um that came back into the body yeah. and and because <laughs> i didn't think i could because like you like you said i i felt like on the other side we reach we go back to our what i call our totality you know in in this life we have a, a we carry with us a fragment of our light but when we cross over we trans you know we we transform back into our light essence who we really are and and that light is feels enormous it, it there's it's not confined at all but the um but the body looks like this little container that is just you know small and and so the enormity of me you know how am i going to get into that body and so there was this this you know resonance that brought us into the body hmm. but it and then when you're in the body it just feels so heavy so confining after having that liberation you just feel so confined and so you know and i was having a tough time because um because the the life vest that I was wearing, it I didn't realize it when I put it on, but I realized that then because when you come back, you feel you you have a heightened awareness. You feel like you're half there and half here for quite a while. For me, it was like three days. I felt like I was half here, half there, and um, and I know other experiencers that tell me that that experience lasted for almost a week, and um, and it's a it's a it's a troubling time because. <laughs> You're trying to, you know, reintegrate into this life, and yet you, you, you know, and and you've got these new experiences that are happening. But with that heightened awareness, I knew that my life vest was um, had dry rotted, and that the fiber filling had gotten super saturated with salt water, and um, it was actually what was pulling me down rather than bringing me up. So if it wasn't for the bitter end of that bow line saving me, <laughs> I probably never would have come up. Was um was it just waterlogged from being from age or something? Yeah, it was just dry. It, was, it had been down in the bosun's locker forever and ever, and it yeah. had just gotten dry rotted. And then when I put it on and put it in, you know, and and started being tumbled and tossed, it just ripped open, you know, and yeah. and uh, and allowed all the salt water to saturate the fiber, you know. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's I what think happens. that's probably why the Coast Guard has since banned those uh, mm -hmm. fly fests, you know. <laughs> They're just, but anyway, yeah. The um, the ones I had were like a 
it's like a thing you could pull it and it blew oh, up and inflatable air. yeah they yeah. were the, the inflatable type yeah that's that's really efficient now mm-hmm. and um and that's what i mean i mean that's what we used as divers for buoyancy compensators we had you know inflatable type vests that we could use to bring us up to the surface but um but these were you know this was this ship had been around for a while and uh and you know this is what we had in the bosun's locker and and it was a rough night and we thought well it'd be smart for us to maybe put on some life vests you know <laughs> yeah uh do you think that maybe your intuition was saying hey man it's time to put on a life jacket something's going to happen well it's interesting it was it was a it was a group decision it was yeah. a group decision mm-hmm. cuz um, yeah yeah cuz uh, you know we had the zodiac all prepped and ready to go over the side and we and then um uh, and then we started, you know, talking like, yeah, it's pretty rough out here. <laughs> yep. So as a as a as a group, we went down the bosun's locker and just grabbed what we could find, you know. You know, they didn't have any problems with theirs. They were they popped right back up, you know, yeah. after the wave hit. And um, and they had stayed together, rallied together, and were, you know, did a head count, saw that I was missing, and um, and stayed on station in that breaker zone until they found me. So mm-hmm. uh, those guys, you know, I mean, that's, that's some heroism there. Well, they were all ex-military, right? Many of them were. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. And especially the guy that um, evaluated that um, the design engineer for the ROV, he was ex-military. Mm-hmm. So it was, uh, yeah. Yeah. Most of them were, most of them were. That's good. We all were, you know, I mean, and we were all uh, mostly were mostly were New Yorkers out in California, so it was kind of an odd. We were an odd bunch out there, you know. <laughs> there are a lot of New Yorkers out in California. <laughs> I've noticed. <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of people bounce back between the two spots. Yeah. So when you when you were working with when you were in Arizona with the natives, and you you said you popped out of your body, or you did some kind of astral projection or something like that Mm -hmm. how did that differ from when you left your body in the nde if at all that's a great question um i don't think anybody's ever asked me that um the uh the the vision quest that i was on um it was like um it was like an astral projection whereas i went into the earth and then found myself floating above um above you know, above my body, but my body wasn't there. Whereas in the life review, when I was outside my body, I could perceive my body. Mm-hmm. But in the in the vision quest, um, I was I was just a part of the experience. Okay. And uh, and 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 instead of meeting like a soul family, I I met a guide who wasn't really clear for me, but he was like behind me. Mm-hmm. He was just behind me, and but I could perceive him. I could perceive this old elderly. I called him Father Mountain because he had this stability about him, this solidness, this grounded sense about him, and and this wisdom. And so, um, so it was a, it was a different type of experience, but it was still it was a it was definitely an OBE, an out of body experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So I've had a lot of, um, I guess, spontaneous uh, OBEs or astral projection, I guess you would call it, ever since I was a kid. And I've never seen my body, though. Like I pop out, like I fly out either through the bottom or roll out and then go up somewhere, but I've never seen myself. Um, And then you were talking about that humming sensation. A lot of times I'll wake up in the middle of about to go out and and I'm there's like a, I don't know if it's humming. It's more like a water rushing oh. and air, and then but there's vibration, and then yeah. you pop out and fly around. Um, were you when when that happened to you when you were non physical? Could you control yourself? Could like could you move around if you wanted to at will, or were you more so being controlled by the experience? In in the near death experience, yes. Um, there was there was the ability to to you know to move to to uh, think in greater terms. There was uh, there was a lot more available. Yeah, in the in the out of body when I was a a young man, 
you know, when I had the vision quest, it was more, it was, I, it wasn't quite as expansive, I can say, you know, it just wasn't, it didn't, I don't, I didn't, but I didn't really play around with it. I was in such awe of, of the wisdom of this guide that came that I was totally focused on him. But I, my vision was way more than what I currently have. You know, I mean, I, mean, I could, I could see across the valley. It was, you know, so. Well, you mentioned that the um, your the totality of your existence was greater when you yeah. were out of your body in the NDE. Um, is that who we are by default, and then we sort of go through some kind of uh, veiling system or something like that? What do you think about all that? Yeah, I have. I definitely have a lot of thoughts about that because it's something that you, you, when you come back, you just you, you you ruminate about all of this. What is this all about? You know, and and try to get a grasp on it so that you can you know continue living your life and not feel like you're nuts. Mm-hmm. The um, I felt my impression is that um, when we're when when we're not in the physical realm, we are in our light body okay and our light body is interconnected with everyone and everything else so there's this interconnection and interdependence that exists within our light body and and so my soul family and i i believe that we were all very very connected and that we've spent many lifetimes together this is the impression that i got and then the um and before this, I had no idea about reincarnation. I mean, that was not even on my radar. But after this, I started to realize that when I came back into my body, that a portion of my light came with me. So there's a part of my light with me, but the greater part of myself still exists in the oneness <laughs> with my soul family. And so and i like to think of I, I like to think of it as kind of a pendulum a lot of times in life we um we tend to swing toward maybe our humanness and other times we may swing toward more of our spiritual nature and so as we do that swinging back and forth and and it's a gentle swing it's you know it, what's bad is when we allow it to get really radical you know one way or the other we need that balance of a gentle swing back and forth and but our light increases and decreases with you know the polarity to our spiritual nature so as we swing toward our spiritual nature you know there's a greater percentage of our light present within us and and but we're always connected we're always connected to our our greater self at least this is the way i see it and and so we have that ability and that's also that's that you you hear about the golden thread and things like that that connect us you know to to oneness but that's also our channel of communication to our higher nature to our soul family to guide spirit guides angels what you know whatever you want to call that fragment of light is within us um some people call it you know the god molecule you know things like that but it resides within us. It's a part of us. And we can utilize that to connect. It's always there. No one really knows the answer to that stuff. But um. No, you see, that's the problem. That's Jay, you bring up a great point. Nobody has the absolute answer because even, and I talk to a lot of near-death experiencers and a lot of people who have had OBEs and, and very profound spiritual experiences and spontaneous awakenings and you name it, you know, and I, because I've been very involved in this community for a long time. And the thing that I see is that we all get glimpses. We all see, a, you know, we're all looking through a small window, you know, and 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 then we're trying to come to a reason with it you know try to come to come to an understanding with it but nobody we tend to because we're living in this physical life we like things to be linear we like things to progress in a certain path and on the other side time doesn't exist and and everything is is available 
within existence okay <laughs> there's not even a moment to talk about it's all just present and so so you know it's it's very hard to explain in earthly terms and with the limited language that we have what that otherworldly realm is like you know and we again we only have this short little visit that we had that uh, is a window into it but we can explore it by connecting with our light within and then allowing it to you know guide us and to give us you know information so having experienced this and i know you had a, a second nde as well and the the arizona stuff um what do you think we're all doing here <laughs> <laughs> well i you know that Remember, I I was told I had a purpose, right? right I went right. I went on a search for. Uh, there were two things that I after the my first experience that that kind of set set me on a path of uh, of exploration. I, I really wanted to learn who who I was. I wanted to learn what was this purpose, and also what was that love that I felt. Um, those were the things that. Uh, the life review really showed me who I was, but the purpose. So the purpose is the question that I probably get the most questions about. But I really feel that we, when in this life, we have a lot. It's not one grand purpose. We have a lot of little purposes that happen along the way. And, but we do have shared purposes because we are interconnected. Okay. So I believe one great purpose is for us to i believe we're here sharing our experience with the oneness okay but also because when we come into this life we pass through this veil of separateness where we feel like we're separate individuals forging our way through life and and so one great challenge for us is to learn that that is just an illusion and that it's that we aren't really separate and that we are connected to the unity of oneness and that you know but but that's a journey in itself and that's a purpose within itself for all of us to find our connection and to you know and to realize that and then along our path there's a lot of little things that happen you know there's synchronicities that happen that that um, suddenly you learn something here, and then the next minute someone crosses your path that's looking for the knowledge that you just learned, you know, and you can be the teacher. Sometimes we're the student, sometimes we're the teacher. And, um, and so all of those, you know, combine together into our purpose. I, that's the way I, I see it. I, I feel that that's part of the reason why we're here is so that we can share Everything that we glean here with the unity of the universe and the oneness. So after the experiences that you had, when did you start talking about it publicly? <laughs> Not for, um, well, publicly was even longer, but um, yeah. it, it was 11 years. I, I shared it right away and I didn't get a very good response. And so I kind of felt like, you know, this is not something you can share. And I didn't have, I had never heard of a near-death experience. I had never, and, and this happened in 83, you know, my first experience. And so we didn't have the type of internet. We didn't have a lot of the research material that we had. And I didn't realize that um, in the 70s, that's when um, uh, Raymond Moody first wrote his book about near-death experiences, life after life. And, <clears throat> but I was, uh, because I was living uh, life at sea most of the time, I really wasn't tapped into that. So I felt very isolated and I didn't feel like I could share it with anyone. So I self-isolated myself for over 11 years before I had a second experience. But after that second experience, I had started changing in my life so much that I had come across other experiencers. And it was it was then that I felt safe enough and secure enough that I could share my experience but even then, I would only share it with very, very, um, you know, few people. But spirit kept nudging me, telling me to to 
to share my experience more. And, and so I thought, okay, uh, you know, I, I thought I'd get one over on spirit, you know, by I'd create a website because in a website, you can put your information out there and still be anonymous behind the scene. Right. So I thought, Hey, this is the way to do it. And, uh, and spirit, you know, and this would satisfy spirit, get spirit to quit, you know, bugging me to, to share my experience. Well, that didn't, you know, that didn't go very long before, uh, before people started asking and, and that's when, and that's when I did. But, but eleven years, I didn't. I after initially trying to share it, I didn't share it with anybody for <clears throat> until I had a second experience, which really, really kind of pushed me to yeah. to share it. So, how do people respond to it now when when you just bring it up? If you do, you know, um, yeah, I don't, I don't hide it at all anymore. Yeah. Um, I, I just don't feel the need. Has the sentiment uh, sort of changed? The, you know, the neat thing is, is the experience never changed, never mm-hmm. changed. It's always rock solid. Um, and, and that's the thing that when you talk to a lot of experiencers, you hear the same thing that, you know, it's more real than this, than life itself. Yeah. And that, um, and, and, and so it, <laughs> it's never changed. It's, it never changes. And it's always with you. It's always with you. In fact, it becomes kind of a guiding star in a lot of ways in, 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 in how you live your life. You gauge your interactions against what you've learned in these experiences. So, um, so people feel that. When I share it now, when I first started sharing, I was very nervous. Okay, And I think people pick up on the nervousness. Not so much the message in the, in the, in the telling. But actually, you know, your nervousness, you project that. And so, you know, we're we're still animalistic in a lot of ways. So, you know, right. if somebody is acting nervous, watch out. People are going to pounce, you know. Yeah. But when I got secure in who I, I'm glad I had those 11 years to really, you know, to integrate this experience. Because when I did start sharing it and sharing it publicly, I was pretty pretty secure in in who I was and, and my experience. In fact, I didn't even read anybody else's experience for a long time because I really wanted to get to know my experience mm-hmm. so that, you know, so that I, I had a firm grasp as to what the meaning was for me and everything. And in doing that, I think it gave a sense of um of confidence in in this is who I am. And mm-hmm. And so I'm going to share my experience. Now, there are still a lot of people that that think that everything I say is just, you know, wash, you know, just, you know, don't bother. But that's their belief. And I can I can say, you know, God bless, you know, I, I understand. Um, but I'm going to be true to who I am. Right. And, you know, um, you mentioned skeptics, you know, we're reaching the point where there's so much evidence about stuff like this, you know, um, with IANS and with the University of Virginia is looking into stuff like this. They've been doing that for, I think, 30 years or something. And they found, um, you know, using traditional scientific method protocols that there are anomalies and experiences that you can't explain away with, you know, uh, oh, that's just people are making it up or something like that. You know, because if you if you have tens of thousands of people who have near death experiences or out of body experiences or whatever it is, there are, as you mentioned before, tiny little fragments that are consistent with each with each one. Yeah, they're all a little bit different in some way, but there's overlap. Maybe eighty percent of it overlaps, and that's sort of a decentralized way of confirming the reality of something in a way. So, yeah, it is. It is absolutely. Um, and uh, and the researchers, I, I've been a part of many research subjects, or uh, par- I've participated in many research projects uh, mm-hmm. over the years, and um, and and I I really applaud the researchers because they try to they're trying to take a look into something that's that's very difficult, and and in today's society, it's still considered a phenomena, you know, it's still un un uh, you know. They just they, they don't have everything they need to to say okay definitively this is what this is 
But there's been a lot of theories over the years, like dying brain syndrome, oxygen deprivation, this, that, the other thing. But the researchers have been able to show where the tell for many of these experiences are the after effects, how it changes an experiencer. Whereas someone but hallucinates doesn't have that sense of, of hyper-reality, doesn't have, in fact, they know that it was a hallucination once they come back, you know? <laughs> Whereas a person who's had a profound spiritual experience, it it's something that is becomes a part of who they are. So it's a huge after effect that is very telling in in you know what was dreamlike versus what was you know a real deep spiritual experience the same thing with obes you 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 still have that sense of something greater than yourself you know <laughs> you know when you hallucinate you don't you don't have that that um that reality part of it you know it feels like something that's unreal and even when they do, they've done all kinds of things, some crazy stuff where they've stimulated sections of the brain in order to try to, in, you know, create an experience like this. Mm -hmm. And people will go out of their body, but they'll feel like, oh, but my arm is still here, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. So, so it's, it's not really the same, you know, um, and, and drugs and things like that. Although I have a number of friends who have had, experiences that were seeded through a drug experience okay so but the drug experience and then it went on it be, it became something much more and so i believe that those are those are just as viable of an experience as as you know someone who dies and comes right. back you know yeah. because we've learned through all the research like you've mentioned that you don't have to die to have these experiences that's why we're hearing so much more about spiritually transformative experiences. If you've had a deep spiritual experiences that changes the way you live your life, you're an experiencer. I mean, you know, it's not a club, you know, you don't, you know, <laughs> it's not a club. Right. And, uh, and anybody, the neat thing is anybody can have these experiences. Yeah. You can learn to have out of body experiences. You can learn, but it requires a spiritual practice of some sort, you know. And and one of the reasons why I started this is to sort of normalize these topics in society. And because what's happening now is that uh, people in academia and the scientific community, they're starting to do research into things like psychedelics, uh, psilocybin, the effects that they can have in helping people with PTSD and depression and things like that. Um, meditation, how it affects the brain, body, all of that. Um, and, and over time, as we have these conversations publicly and people realize that the, the experiencers like yourself and others, they're not crazy people. You know, they're professionals. They're probably more qualified than a lot of others. Um, it starts to normalize this stuff. And then people can actually research it and actually study it and take it seriously. I, yeah, Jay, I Bravo, bravo, because that's uh, I the only reason I feel like I, I continue to um to talk about it right. is because it it creates the more experiencers share their experience, the more it does normalize it. Mm -hmm. And the more that people are gonna understand. Because back when I had mine, experiencers were very closeted. You know, and because they didn't feel like they could share it because uh, most of the communities and most, uh, you know, most societies, there was there wasn't any acceptance of it. So it was very difficult for experiencers to share their experience. And and so now with so many new avenues um, to be able to express it, to be able to normalize it, like you mentioned, I think that that's it's great. I think it's it's amazing and it's helpful for the experiencers because now the experiencers don't have to be afraid to share what it is that they've gone through, and the and so I think that this is a positive step for all of us, you know, mm -hmm. to to under, have a better understanding of what's going on here. Yeah, it also helps people. You know, I mean, I, I've listened to probably 
every NDE story on the internet. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's helped me deal with certain things. Um, it, you know, uh, it's helped me see life in a different way uh, to sort of alleviate suffering and things like that. And I think it helps a lot of other people as well. Um, yeah. So. Kenneth Ring, who was one of the founders of IANS, uh, coined a phrase, the benevolent virus, <clears> that <throat> by listening to these experiences, you catch a benevolent virus that changes the way you live your life. Because in listening to these experiences, many of the times these experiences give people a tool, a way of looking at life, you know. And yeah, you can't you can't listen to a hundred Endy ears or experiences like that and and realize the overlap between the two and have it not affect your awareness or how you think about things or your belief systems in some way you know you, it's going to change you somehow you're probably going to be you know at least more compassionate towards other people or something um i wanted to talk one about one more thing so your work with ians what you mentioned that you um you did some stuff with them other than the research that you were a part of, what um, kind of projects were you involved with with that or, or leadership or whatever? Yeah, yeah. I um, I started out um, just as a member, an IANS member, because um, I really felt that the research that they uh, were doing uh, helped validate, you know, for experiencers. And so I, I really wanted to support them. So I became a member. But then I soon realized that um, they had groups, you know, all, uh, all over the world. They have groups all over the world, uh, local groups. And so I, I started calling the office and saying, hey, you know, how come there's not a local group near me? And they said, well, Dave, you know, you could start a local group near you. And so I became uh, a local group leader in upstate New York. Um, and I did that for about 11 years. And then um, I moved down here in Virginia Beach and I became involved with the, the local uh, group here in Virginia Beach. I, I I, they eventually, you know, convinced me to be on the board for a while. But then, uh, and and then IANS, the international organization, um, recruited me to be a board member and to also be the um, the coordinator for all the groups worldwide. And so I was the local groups coordinator worldwide for, for a while. And i just recently stepped back from all of that. Um, I'm not, I'm not involved with IANS at all right now. I'm just a, a regular member again, but, um, but I really honor what it is that they've done. You know, um, yes, they, they started out as a group of academics, but they've brought in the experience and, and they've evolved, you know, they, they now just not just look at near death experiences, but all spiritually transformative experiences, and they've grown, you know, they used to be local groups was the way to connect, you know. Well, now they have, um, because of some, you know, some 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 individuals within the organization that had the foresight, they started an online platform before the pandemic hit. So when the pandemic hit, they already had uh, a way for local groups to still meet but online. So, so they now, you don't have to have a local group now with IANS. You can go on their website and connect with meetings that they have where, you know, experiences and, and, and researchers, and they have all kinds of, of material now available that, um, that just wasn't there when I had my experience and, or when I, when I was a local group leader, I mean, they just have a lot available now. Yeah, it's a great site, and um, there are probably thousands and thousands of NDE stories on there that people can go read um, if they if you can't get enough on YouTube and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, so it's, it's everywhere now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it's great. So um, now that you're no longer doing that, what are you working on now? I, I was looking at your website. It looks like you have a lot going on. Woodwork. Uh, Consulting. Yeah, you know, I've kind of stepped back because I did have, you know, I had stage four lung and bone cancer and um and right now I'm going through another little cancer episode. Mm -hmm. And so um stepping back is was healthy for me. It, you know, it just it, it, the, what I was doing was was very very intense with Brian. So so to step back, it's more of a, a health thing for me. But yeah, but I still do um energetic healing because of what I learned um in my 
journey because I had stage four lung and bone cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I do, I do that. And the easiest way for people to reach me is to just go to my website, uh, dharmatalks.com. And, um, and, and from there you can see YouTube because I also, one of the things I've learned in my journey is that um, to have a practice, some kind of practice. And my practice is um, spiritual contemplation. So it's a meditation where then you pose a question to your guidance and you have a conversation. And so then I take that conversation, I distill it down and I put it out on, you know, on my YouTube channel. I have a, a, a weekly uh, feed that I call contemplative living. And, um, and I, and also I do, I still do the healing work where I, uh, you know, I, I will go into the light, connect with someone's light purpose, light essence, and, and then uh, use that. To, that's what guides me in the energy work. So I'm still active. I'm still, you know, and, and then the woodworking, that's just, that's, uh, that's kind of uh, helps balance me out. It allows me to use my creative nature, you know, mm-hmm. Yeah, the woodworking was great. I wasn't sure what that looked like until I went on your website and checked it out. And um, I was thinking whittling because that's what I did when I was in Boy Scouts. Right, this isn't, right. This isn't whittling. This is like top uh, notch. I mean, uh, yeah. I and nowadays there's so many different media. You can mix media along with your woodworking, which is really <laughs> makes it really fun. Um, but like like what's behind me there is uh is an altar that i built you know and and uh and because i i wanted an altar to represent my experience and stuff and when you open the doors you'll see you know whatever it is that you you know want to put in your altar but uh but an altar is is just all it is 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 a is something that you want to elevate above Mm -hmm. so um and and in a spiritual practice, it's nice to have a sacred space. So that little space that you see behind there, that's kind of my sacred space that I, when I meditate, I kind of turn around and and uh, and and use that as a focal point. Yeah. You know? Okay. Um. Then you also wrote some books. You want to talk about those? Yeah. Well, I wrote down my experience and and the journey that it put me on. It's called Voyage of Purpose. It's available on Amazon and, you know, you can get it through book book retailers and stuff like that. Um, it was published through a publisher, which I feel really honored that somebody really thought that much of my experience. Um, I didn't think it would ever be published, but Spirit was very confident and kind of pushed me to write this book. But then also I have another book out there that's out of print, but you can still get it through my website. It's called... Um, uh, 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 a voice as old as time, and it's about uh, contemplations for spiritual development, basically. And um, and it, it, but you can you can get that through me, basically, or you can, you know, buy it used on on Amazon or something like that. Mm-hmm. David, thanks so much for coming on. Jay, thanks so much for inviting me to be on your show. <laughs>